I'm really delighted uh, to welcome uh, to the SSP Wednesday Seminar, Asmat Khan um, from Columbia uh, University. She's going to talk today on the civilian uh, casualty files. She's an award-winning investigative journalist with the New York Times Magazine, a Carnegie Fellow, and an assistant professor of journalism at Columbia University. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here and looking forward to your questions. So. If, if I can begin, um, you know, I'd love to tell you a little bit about, you know, how I came to do the work that I've been doing. And I think a good place to start, you know, despite the fact that I've been in Pakistan back in 2008 and 2009 as America's drone war there escalated and other different kinds of war reporting that I've done, I think where this story began for me was watching just these incredible you know, watching ISIS take territory across broad swaths of Iraq and Syria and watching as how not just how quickly it spread, but how much difficulty we had encountering ISIS. And I just want to show a few slides that I think can help indicate just how powerful, uh, you know, the air campaign actually was in retaking territory from ISIS. So if you take a look at this slide, this is just one of the differences where you can see that that darker red territory was what was left in 2018 of what had once been ISIS territory and sort of what it looked like at its peak in January of 2015, how much space they had taken over in broad swaths of this area. And you can see that that territory was retaken. And a major reason for that is, you know, what we would call Operation Inherent Resolve. And this was just extraordinarily impressive. If you were watching some of these videos that were on YouTube, you could see these airstrikes take place with extreme precision. You could watch aircraft essentially refueling other aircraft mid-air so they could carry out these long flights from the airbase in Qatar. And you saw these really impressive stats and this incredible information campaign to counter what had been the Islamic, you know, the so-called Islamic State's narrative about having successes on the ground. And so, you know, at the time, and these numbers are different today, but at the time that I was looking at this, I was seeing these sort of tens of thousands of airstrikes in Iraq and Syria, and, you know, more than 100,000 bombs being dropped in those countries, and claims of as many as 70,000 ISIS fighters being killed. And then on top of that, a really unique thing that you don't often see, which was you know, this kind of accountability in war that very few militaries would do, which is to actually count how many civilians were dying and to put out these press releases about what those numbers were. And I think for many, as this was unfolding, especially in 2015 and 2016, it was, you know, these numbers often went unchallenged. I remember very specifically in early 2016, looking at a front page of a major newspaper and a sort of statement that, you know, 20 or 25,000 ISIS fighters had been killed without really any attribution of that fact or, uh, you know, questions about it. And yet, if you actually look at this, these numbers and you look at the numbers of civilian deaths that were occurring and the numbers of airstrikes that were occurring, you were looking at airstrikes that were resulting in an extremely low civilian death rate. And it would really defy uh, standards of the past and really usher in not just the most precise air war in history, but something that is just extremely curious, given that these airstrikes were taking place in densely populated neighborhoods. Um, but if you look at some of these videos, you can see yourself just how precise um, we can conduct airstrikes today. And so technology was clearly involved in playing a role. You see these two compounds here. And so I was consuming a lot of these videos looking at what was happening. And, and this is what it looks like from the air. If you're not on the ground, which it was very hard to do at the time, right? ISIS has taken over territory. We've seen journalists and other foreigners beheaded by them. You know, it's difficult to operate in these places and we're largely consuming, you know, it's largely ISIS propaganda that is making its way online from ISIS territory or it's videos like these uh, from the military, military that we were seeing. So this is what it looked like from the air 
So it's, and uh, let me show you what it looked like, you know, from the ground. And I just want to step in. So you can see, actually, I took some satellite imagery of the, the video I just showed you, and you can just see how precise that was. You know, nothing else around those two targets was really touched here. And that's, this is a very, you know, I've talked to and met with people within the military who've said that, look, you know, we could take out a very specific part of a house, like a single room, and not damage others. We now have missiles that can target a single individual in a car and leave the rest of it untouched. Uh, which is really just a new era of warfare. But this is Mosul. And um, specifically, this is an area known as Abat. It's the woods. And, you know, I've met, you know, in my time there, I met a man named Basim, who actually, Basim Razo had actually lived in the United States for a number of years. And, you know, lived in Mosul with his family. They had, you know, two houses that were connected with one another, he and his brother and his brother's family. Um, so he lived in this area with his wife Mayada, his brother Mohanad, his daughter Tukka, and his nephew Najib. And they were just very, you know, when ISIS took over, this was a family that really had to work hard to protect themselves. And the, their homes became a refuge for them. Um, you can see them here. And Najib, his nephew, you know, would often, they, you know, for women, it was hard to be out and about in Mosul. So really, they stayed at home. They had barbecues. Um, they had a great time together. They were trying as mu much as they could to kind of get by. But one day, Najib, who was, you know, had a kind of westernized buzz cut, according to ISIS, was kind of caught when he was out at a market buying dairy cream for breakfast and chastised for having like a Western logo on his shirt and this Western style haircut. And he was given lashes. And, you know, Najib became incredibly depressed. The family hunkered down at home and tried to get by as best they could. Now, what I didn't tell you earlier is that this video that I showed you earlier um, was also the homes of Mohanad, of Basim Razo and his family members. And this is what it looked like when Basim and I came to visit. And so, you know, it was really tough because Basim woke up in the middle of the night and rather than seeing, you know, the roof over his head, he saw the stars above Mosul. And he called out for his wife who didn't answer. And, you know, he would later learn in the hospital that his wife, Mayada, his daughter, Tuka, his brother, Mohanad, and his nephew, Najib, had all been killed. And that same day, in just a few hours, the video that I showed you was uploaded to YouTube calling their homes a car bombing factory. And so when I met Basim and I started to learn his story, you know, he was one of many survivors I had met who had these tales of civilian casualties who had been dubbed something else entirely, right? In this case, these were two family homes that were called in a YouTube video, a car bombing factory, but he was one of many. And I wanted to understand, well, how often does this occur? You know, how precise are those numbers that are being shared actually? What does precision mean when your technology can do wonders, but your intelligence may not be correct. So I set out to do a ground sample in Iraq. And, you know, I went to the sites of different airstrikes in as many places as I could. Um, and in the end of the ground sample, I was able to visit to the, the sites of 103 in three cluster areas. Um, Shora, which is a sort of like medium sized municipality, Kayara, an urban center, but not as large as you know, Mosul by any means, but these were three areas around Mosul that I was able to sample, meaning that I went door to door to visit, you know, any sort of bomb structure and, you know, around the neighborhood, including if there had been airstrikes on the road, et cetera, to plot how many airstrikes occurred and how many of those resulted in the deaths of civilians. And, you know, there was a lot more to it than mere interviews. You know, obviously, I would spend time investigating, um, you know, digging through the rubble, looking at what was happening on the ground, you know, uh, flying drones in some cases. So I just want to show you, this is a young girl, Rawa, who lost, you know, all of her family. She was the lone survivor of an airstrike that killed her parents and her siblings. And, um, you know, she had to move in with extended family 
This is a water sanitation plant area. And these are some of the injuries that people sustain. So I would document their injuries. I would get their information, um, you know, the different kinds of um, IDs that they might have, any records they have of what happened. I would try to analyze any fragments of weapons and munitions. And my co-author and I, we would take these two, you know, different weapons experts to try to identify them. I, you know, dug through rubble to look for any evidence of ISIS presence. Um, you know, I also, you know, worked hard to, when possible, sort of document these from the air, because sometimes it's easier to notice or see some of these, like pictures on the ground can show you so much, but when I would turn in these coordinates and what I found happened to the U.S. military, sometimes it's helpful to render these more visually from the air, because they're a little bit more identifiable to people, even if you give them a coordinate. Um, just to kind of show the kind of scale of damage, and so I did this, um, this is Giles, um, this is a photographer with the New York Times Magazine, and he essentially flew this drone over to take these pictures and make this 3D rendering when we were in Kayara. You know, I also plotted where ISIS did function, you know, in an effort to try to understand, like, did this take place near, did this airstrike or the civilian casualty incident take place near a legitimate target? You know, were they perhaps trying to um, hit that target? And it was a very extensive ground sample that involved, you know, certainly a lot of documentation, looking at before and after satellite imagery to verify the dates and bomb blast areas and to really understand what had happened very specifically. Um, but it also meant that I was like archiving and saving a lot of these videos that the coalition put out. For example, the first video that I showed you, you know, really looking for any changes that were happening on the coalition's YouTube pages. There was a day in which they deleted all of these airstrike videos that they had previously been uploading uh, to YouTube after shortly after I questioned them about them. Um, and then just really starting to collect data and document this and develop a methodology for doing that cluster based sample. And in the end, um, you know, I also was able to in the beginning for this first story, I was able to, you know, request records in the case of what happened in Boston Razo's incident using a kind of creative argument of, for expedited processing. And, you know, I would take these coordinates, I would take the satellite imagery, I would bring them to the military, and I would ask if they conducted a strike on that date, because sometimes it's the Iraqi Air Force that is striking particular places, and just go back and forth with them over, you know, they would deny sometimes that they conducted something. So for example, that water sanitation facility or this particular bridge. And, you know, I'd kind of follow up based on some of the YouTube videos that I'd saved and was able to uncover that they weren't logging all of their coordinates, which is why they were sometimes saying, like, we didn't conduct anything in this area at that time. Sometimes they would conduct five airstrikes in under an hour. And in the end, um, you know, we concluded, uh, the sociologist I worked with and I, we concluded that, you know, according to the coalition's data, but based on this database of all of those press releases I built, that one in 157 airstrikes in Iraq was resulting in a civilian death. But on the ground, one in five was, which was a rate that was, you know, 31 times higher than what the coalition was claiming. And that's that's really quite stunning. Um, causes, though, you know, why are so many deaths happening are a little bit harder to explain. The coalition often would cite, if they did cite a cause, they would often explain, you know, close proximity, what people might think of as collateral damage, so-called collateral damage. Um, or secondary explosions, when they might target, for example, a major weapons factory, and there would be subsequent explosions um, after that. But it appeared to us that poor or outdated intelligence was involved in about half of these civilian casualty incidents. And what I mean by that is, is that perhaps they were targeting an ISIS structure, I'm sorry, perhaps they were targeting uh, you know, an ISIS individual who had left an area. That could be outdated intelligence. Or, for example, in the case of Boston, where they had conflated a target um, or believed it to be something else, you know, often because of something that's known as confirmation bias. But it was very difficult for me to get answers as to what they thought something was, right? Like, I could say I found X, Y, Z on the ground, but it really was harder, I think, to distill what intelligence they had, because I would be told, this is classified information. All we can tell you is that we were targeting a car bombing factory, or we were targeting an ISIS headquarters. Now, those incomplete logs that I mentioned really matter because when somebody submits a civilian casualty incident uh, or an allegation to the coalition, 
you know, they would often be told, oh, we didn't find anything that took place on this date in this location. But if you're searching incomplete logs, you're far more likely to result in not finding the corresponding airstrike because you're not logging all of those coordinates. And these maybe fair allegations wouldn't get investigated. And it was an extreme problem at the time. We also found a broken payment system. You know, every year Congress had authorized millions of dollars for payments and really hadn't paid out a single Iraqi or Syrian civilian until they made their first payment offer to actually Basim Razo. And he rejected it because he found it, um, you know, an insult. They offered him $15,000 for those deaths and his own injuries that he'd probably spent far more money um, treating and these homes that they'd spent lives building, you know, on farmland um, of his father. I was able to, because of that argument about expedited processing, I was able to get a document about why they did target the Razo homes. And I made, the argument I made was that he, there was potential threat to his life and that this was, you know, that people might conflate him with being ISIS because of that video that was uploaded and the fact that, you know, this was so precisely targeted and dubbed ISIS and that, you know, rogue militias might target him for that reason. And so, you know, instead of it taking four or seven years to get the sort of assessment that was conducted into the airstrike on his homes, I got it in about four months. And it really had stunning details of confirmation bias, of confusing this with another potential target, of saying that they saw no domestic activity, even though they filmed for like an hour and 45 minutes during some of the hottest days, of summer. Somebody, you know, who'd spent a lot of time investigating this, I was blown away by some of the details in here. And I really wanted to know, like, what does it look like? You know, I get these press releases every month. What do these others look like when, you know, we apparently conduct, I think, you know, what was constantly talked about as one of the most precise air wars in history? What does that actually look like in terms of this accountability mechanism that the United States has been boasting about? these numbers that we put out, what is the process they go through? If that's what they went through with Boston Razo, it turns out they may have used the wrong coordinate and confused it with the house next door. They filmed for an hour and 45 minutes. And, you know, certainly like at various points, they say there was no overtly nefarious activity or, you know, nothing significant to observe. And yet they still carried this out, right? What is the case in all of these other thousands now of assessments that they've conducted? So, Following the publication of the story that I that I first wrote with, with Anand Gopal called The Uncounted, I sort of set out to try to get those other records. And it was a process of years. Uh, I had help from the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, and we filed a lawsuit against the Department of Defense and U.S. Central Command. I think I now have two lawsuits against them um, for more than, you know, 2,800 plus of these records, these assessments, investigations, some of them are just emails in which they go through a process to either reject or accept a civilian casualty allegation as credible or non-credible. And, you know, it took years to start getting these records, but I had built a database based on them and I started to ingest them. And over time, and I'm just going to show you a little bit about what this looks like, over time I started to analyze them and try to visit as many of them as I could on the ground to do a sort of cross comparison. And so, you know, in this database, uh, you know, I put in things I was seeing in there, not just in terms of causes, um, but other kinds of factors involved um, in terms of, you know, was there a secondary explosion? What kind of pre-strike intelligence did they do? Did they see civilians in their midst? You know, there's a process that they go through that is talked about quite a bit about pattern of life analysis, about, you know, looking for the presence of civilians. And in case after case, I was constantly seeing, I think the factor that was most observed in most of them was that, you know, they determined that there was no civilian presence in the area. And in fact, you know, in many cases, there would be dozens of people gathered inside a home or in homes in that area. They just weren't leaving because of the ongoing fighting. And the sort of no civilian presence detected kind of gave them the ability to declare things proportional, right? If you do seconds of a collateral scan, you're not going to see civilians. Um, I think one document that just really blew me away, 
was, you know, it described this chemical weapons factory in Mosul and this kind of incredible intelligence they had to target the structure. And in the document I have, they label incredibly precisely, you know, where this took place. They identify these different parts of this chemical weapons production facility, and they present that target for review, right? You know, most airstrikes take place in a matter of minutes or hours. They're known as, uh, you know, these these dynamic airstrikes. And a, a rarer majority, a rarer percentage of these are deliberate airstrikes. They go through a more lengthy review process. They're not as urgent um, or critical in real time to have to complete. So they can go through a lengthier process. And I was just also stunned by how even those that went through the lengthier processes could have, could be riddled with incredible flaws. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. So I'm looking at this chemical weapons factory that they have identified in this area and they describe how everyone in this pre-strike review meeting authorizes it and says that this strike is good to go. And one person in this room who it's unclear to me as to why they were there, they, they work for USAID, a development agency, but they were in this review board meeting and they essentially said that they disagreed with the analysis. They thought that some children who'd been observed in the area playing lived in the compound or in the area that they were targeting and that conducting that airstrike could likely result in the deaths of those children. They saw 10 children in footage. It appears that, you know, based on statements she later made that were documented in this, in this assessment, that that was ignored. The airstrike was carried out. And a few days later, photos of dead children surfaced online. And, you know, it was, I think, in the very first batch of documents I got in this lawsuit. And I looked at it and I was just, blown away that the one person in that room or the one person involved in this decision to authorize the strike who wasn't trained in intelligence was the only person who accurately interpreted the intelligence at hand. What does it tell you about confirmation bias? And who was that family? Where are they? Who were those children? Who were they related to? Were they related to ISIS members? That document had um, imagery inside it that it was redacted, but I was able to, because of the exact compound that they depicted, I was able to geolocate it to a neighborhood in Mosul called Yabisat in Western Mosul. And it didn't take long to find the family. Everyone knew who I was talking about. And there was a brother who was still living. He lived down the street from his brother who lived there with his family and 21 member, 22 members of their family, I think were killed that night. And he described picking up their pieces. I was able to find videos online of the aftermath of that bombing and identify the children in this family and really report out, you know, what had happened. And it was so important to me from that, you know, from taking these documents and from, and finding where they took place on the ground. And with time, I was able to do that more systematically. Um, and visit the sites, at least in Iraq and Syria, I think it was more than, I, in total, I visited the sites of more than 100 civilian casualty incidents in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. And in many of them, I was able to trace the details, find the victims, and sort of document what happened. But more than that, I was able to sort of, you know, I feel like it's the most important journalism I've ever done, but I was able to take the documents that detail these targeting decisions that the military had and bring them to some of the people who were on the receiving end of that who were plagued by these questions of why were we hit? Why were we targeted? And ask them about some of the details of them and tell them about some of what was in them and ask them for their own responses. And, you know, there's one, I don't want to spoil it now and, and tell you too many details about it, but if you have a chance to listen to an episode of the New York Times podcast, The Daily, I think it was from like January 18th or 19th, you can actually listen to one of these interviews in which, you know, I deconstruct what happens in a document and take you to meet a woman who knows some of the people in it. And I don't want to spoil it, but I think it's just, you know, it's a question of not just what we owe those we harm, but what it means that we have this system of accountability that we talk about, certainly, you know, we're talking about right now in the face of Russia's egregious war crimes in Ukraine, 
right? And, and what the United States is doing is very different. But we have a system of accountability that frankly, when I went through the 1300 records I obtained, and others went through them as well, we did not find one instance, a single instance of a finding of wrongdoing or disciplinary action. Not a single one. There was one possible rule of engagement violation, but it appears to have gone nowhere. So what does it mean when you have a system that military officials I spoke to told me was intended, in fact, actually functioned not as a system of accountability, but as a system to sort of prevent findings of wrongdoing, in many ways to prevent that kind of accountability that others might seek, to ward off accusations of war crimes. And, you know, there are very specific reasons for that. But when you, when your intelligence is so systematically off, right, or it's certainly not what you're claiming in terms of a level of precision and detail and care, how much do these decisions of declaring things proportional, right, that the expected military advantage is proportional to what might be gained, how accurate of a proportionality decision do you actually have? And these were some of the questions that I wrestled with, and they were published in several pieces in the New York Times, um, one in the newspaper, uh, one in the magazine, um, each of which was like 10,000 words, so they're pretty lengthy. And then, you know, certain follow-up articles and series with others um, that sort of look at what this means when we've conducted an air war that looks so different, not just on the ground, but when you analyze the sort of intelligence and these files, the system of accountability, does it really function as one or does it actually function as a system of, a, of impunity? And is this a broken system or was a system designed to function this way? And these are the sorts of questions that I think are worthy of public debate. I think that, you know, Americans need to be informed about the wars taken in their names, but we've been woefully uninformed for quite some time, in part because of the radical shift that's taken place, which is that certainly since 2015 onward, in most of the major wars that America has been embroiled in, we have fought primarily by air. You know, the the numbers of troops on the ground that we lost in Iraq and Afghanistan really made it unpalatable to continue at that pace, to continue deploying more ground troops to fight. Instead, we were sort of assisting and training partner forces or we were carrying out airstrikes from the air to assist partner forces. And what that means is that when Americans, you know, are not dying in such high numbers in our wars, so for example, in Operation Inherent Resolve, this air war in Iraq and Syria, more Americans died from suicide than from hostile death. So when you don't have as many Americans dying, which do not get me wrong, it's a very good thing that fewer American service members are losing lives. But when you don't have that, what you often also don't have is the kind of accountability that is driven by those losses. And I don't just mean journalists, being on the ground and embedding and being there. But I mean, the kind of accountability that comes from public demands about wars, um, about congressional attention, about a focus on ending them or thinking through the costs of conflict, because those are often restraining factors. They're political costs to wars that are then thus diminished significantly. It doesn't mean that there are no longer any costs. But I think for most Americans, you know, what has been a driving force in being informed about wars and for accountability or even just an impetus to end them has often been feeling those kinds of losses and feeling those costs. And when you take that out of the picture, what are you left with? And there are arguments by many who've, argued, who've said that, you know, you're left with wars that are easy to, easier to perpetuate, you know, easier to green light, but also easier to forget and to continue without stopping or trying to really limit them. And you're essentially functioning in a you know democratic society that's supposed to be having an informed debate about wars and doesn't really get to see how we've now shifted much of the human costs of war, our wars, to foreign populations. And so it's something that you know I'm writing about beyond just the civilian casualty files in a book I'm working on. And I hope I hope this work will will leave you with questions of not just 
you know, I, many people want to ask about war crimes and what it means that America conducts war in this fashion, but also about what it means for me, this is also just really about what it means to be in a democratic society that has should be having informed debates about war. And how do you get them when the information can be so questionable? So I'd love to hear your questions, your thoughts. I'm really excited to hear from you. So the floor is open. Raise your hands. Um, I'll keep a list. Osmond, I'll, I'll sort of call out for you. And also folks on the Zoom, uh, please raise your hands as well. So I saw Sam first. Sam, go ahead. Uh, Samuel Leiter, uh, second year PhD student in the department. Um, thanks so much for your talk today. This was really interesting and really impressive work. Um, I'm kind of curious, you know, you observed this over two administrations, different policy shifts in the operations. Are there any differences in sort of the uh, tolerance to a degree of civilian casualties that you notice between administrations or between different periods of the conflict, or is it pretty consistent throughout? Um, and again, thank you so much. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so actually, it's over three administrations, Obama, Trump, Biden. And you certainly did see shifts um, at various points in time. And I remember when I was watching the sort of Obama-Trump shift, I was very cautious about drawing any conclusions in part because I think people were making a lot of political uh, interpretations of an escalated air war and they were drawing it to a change in administration when there had been a change in the pace of the air campaign simply because of major battles that took place. So the battle for Mosul and the battle for Raqqa took place actually in between they overlapped um, these administrations. And I think that uh, certainly the battle for Mosul did. And, you know, many people were interpreting the, num the rise in the number of airstrikes in Mosul as a direct result of, you know, President Trump coming into office. But that specific battle where you started to see these numbers really go up had started under the Obama administration. And there had been two executive orders, the first of which had been under Obama, the second of which took place on the first day Trump came into office, both of which changed some of these ground rules, and you saw changes to that effect. But I think one would be wrong not to inter understand the fundamental shift that took place earlier under the Obama administration to focus more on air wars to begin with, um, or to see you know what took place in Afghanistan in 2019. So this was under President Trump, but we saw more airstrikes in Afghanistan in 2019 than in any more bombs dropped in that country than in any previous year of that war. And at the same time, at the same time, we saw less media coverage than we'd ever seen that year, especially in television news. I think it's partly why so many people were caught off guard, not just by the withdrawal, but by the fact that we lost that war, that it was unwinnable as documented or you know believed to be unwinnable. Um, by so many American officials, as documented in the Afghanistan papers um, by Craig Wetlock. You know, there was really something taking place, and one might trace it to the Trump administration, you know, because there was a rise in the number of these airstrikes as they were negotiating as an effort to gain ground on the um, in those negotiations and put the Taliban in a weaker position. But I, I have to be honest that overall there is a system in place that the military has. And what I've heard is that efforts to change that are often met with, you know, you're not in this, you don't understand this at various points. If civilian, if there are these kinds of civilian efforts, you know, I've talked to many people who've described this. And I would encourage you to read, there's a really strong piece in, I think it was The Atlantic, it's called An Accounting for the Uncounted. It came out shortly after that first story I published came out, um, The Uncounted, and it was by two former Obama administration officials who sort of weigh that shift. And they both say that, you know, we take responsibility. We were part of an administration that fell short. And so there was certainly an effort to grapple with. I thought some of the ideas in that piece from them were really fascinating and thoughtful. You know, they talked about what that shift meant. Um, but I am hesitant you know, to make any overtly, because I think from the data, you know, there is a difference between <laughs> correlation and cause. And certainly you can see some changes that took place, but I think there's a system in place to begin with that is extremely difficult to change. 
Out to the Zoom now and uh, to Suzanne Freeman. Suzanne, over to you. Sounds good. Hi, thank you so much for a really interesting talk and a really upsetting talk as well, um, but really great work. Um, I think in political science, we think a lot about the effects of violence, um, specifically on civilians. And I'm curious to ask you, sort of, do you think, I mean, this is maybe sort of a banal question, but do you think that these airstrikes make people make people on the ground more likely to support insurgent groups or simply less likely to support US involvement? And additionally, sort of, how do you think intelligence analysts could be better trained to see the types of things that that USAID worker saw that they didn't see? Yeah, these are great questions. Um, so for the first, these kinds of, you know, how do they affect people on the ground? It's different in whatever place you're in. And I found this myself. So Iraq and Syria are a little bit more complicated and I can draw down those distillations, but in Afghanistan, it was quite clear. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the South. So in Kandahar, especially documenting airstrikes. I also went, you know, after the fall of, of the Afghan government. And it was actually the first time I was able to get to some of these areas that I'd been wanting to go to for so long. But to be really frank with you, couldn't go to because I was terrified, not of just of Taliban kidnapping and Taliban reprisals. But at that point, I knew about the intelligence behind these air campaigns, and I was terrified of dying in an airstrike. And so when that war ended, was really the first time I was able to get to some of these places. And I spent, it's like in the last part of the newspaper story, you know, I take you into this village. Like I sampled a single village. Um, it's organized by mosque. Um, I tried to go to one household associated with each mosque in an area known as Bande Timor, in this specific village um, within Bande Timor. And at least every household had lost at least five civilian family members, which is just, stunning if you think about it and the majority of those occurred from airstrikes and it wasn't just airstrikes it was the combination of u.s backed forces who were conducting these night raids in which they would come and arrest all the men all the men in the village and then charge bribes for their release and so many of them were extremely poor and couldn't afford it you know i i heard about one man who was he was soon to be married he couldn't afford the bribe so he makes a run for the desert and when he made a run as this night raid was sort of starting, you know, the word spreads quickly. A lot of the men start running towards the, the desert. Some, many make it, some don't. Um, but if you're seen fleeing like that, most of them were killed as they were fleeing night raids and they would dive in airstrikes. And it was this combination of these corrupt Afghan forces and a local population that was just you know, in these airstrikes on the on this local population that was just besieged by this war. And so I asked everyone, you know, like, what did you think about this war in the beginning? And in this village, you know, it started in 2002 when an important tribal elder, there was a night raid on his home of Americans. This man supported the Americans. There was no evidence that otherwise that has ever been made public. And he was killed and 50 of his sort of people were arrested. I talked to people who told me they went you know, they heard a commotion they came to go see it. When they appeared at that house, they were also arrested. They were stripped naked. They were taken to a, um, I think to Bagram and, you know, like really humiliated. And it turned this entire village over time against the Americans. And that spread, there were two similar such incidents in nearby villages in Bande Timor where something similar happened. Um, I think it was Nurkhel and Malikhel where major tribal elders who were aligned, right? There was a lot of like corruption anyway, they were killed and it just spread. And then these villages became, you know, as they hardened, um, you know, they became the site of these airstrikes. And there was, you know, so Bande Timor lies across this specific part of it that I was in, lies across the kandahar Helmand border. And they had the Americans coming on one side and they had the Brits coming on the other. And then they had this like years of airstrikes. So many of them left. They literally crossed the border. They went wherever else they could. And many of them supported the Taliban, right? Um, they supported the Taliban incredibly. And you can document like a very clear, clear effect in Kandahar and Helmand on how civilian casualties were an enormous part of some of the most fierce areas of resistance. And you can document it in forensic detail. You can look at from 2002 onwards as to which you know, local leaders were being killed. 
And what happened for whatever corruption, bribe, oftentimes there would be local warlords vying for power or local, not even warlords, just men with commercial business interests. And somebody had a timber factory and they wanted to knock out this rival for contracts. And, you know, they would give intelligence and call in these raids. And so certainly that has been the case in Afghanistan for years now. It's layered and layered. Uh, Iraq is, and I should be very clear, I want to, uh, you know, the Taliban committed egregious abuses against civilians. Now, we know that it's been so well documented. What has been less well documented are the numbers of civilians dying in these areas that have been so inaccessible. So the United Nations for years has been putting up these numbers about the numbers of civilians killed by Taliban versus by, you know, the U.S. and its partner forces. And I, I would really raise questions about the accuracy of those numbers because of how inaccessible they are, the methodology used for the number of sources you need. So, for example, in the village I was in, no one had death certificates. That's how isolated from the Afghan government they were. So I had to document deaths by visiting tombstones and graveyards, and they were everywhere. Like there were graveyards everywhere. And, you know, fighters are very clearly identified um, on tombstones as well. So, you know, when I talked to pe people, this is post fall, especially that I was doing these interviews. So people were very open about who in their family was Taliban and who wasn't. There was no more fear of reprisal for that. And it was just really stunning. I don't think the numbers we've had were right. I think one of the major reasons that the United States lost Afghanistan, you know, in these bastions of Taliban support were because of civilian casualties. But I do fear that that is not a narrative that's being talked about enough when, you know, Congress is, you know, putting together a commission on Afghanistan. You know, I really question whether, because we don't know the full extent of it, right? Look, we never got the true numbers. Um, I really do worry that that's, that's going unknown. And then in terms of your question about like military intelligence and training, and I think that if you are a person, and this is based on the records and people I've spoken to, if you are a person who's constantly looking at targets and you're told this is a target, and we have good intelligence, you're gonna see targets everywhere, right? And if this USAID official had been someone who was constantly looking at targets, you know, it's not always the case. I think that there are brilliant people who do this work, but I think that confirmation bias is an overarch it's an overriding factor in, in many of these airstrikes that have resulted in civilian casualties. You know, I describe in the stories people who identify like <laughs> men driving in motorcycles in formation, which was like the signature of an ISIS attack, were targeted as a result of this, right? They were identified and targeted for airstrikes and then later on were concluded to be civilians. Some of the most innocent things were interpreted as evidence of ISIS and made them legitimate targets. And I don't know that, I don't know that the current system is working, right? I think that, you know, there are some who would make different arguments. I, I don't, I mean, I'm only a journalist, so I can't make policy prescriptions, but, you know, I've heard different arguments from various people. I've heard some argue that you need more people doing intelligence who are also on the ground, right? I've heard that, um, you know, that being on the ground can actually be just as murky as described, right? When you're basing information on tips and threats where people might have their own incentives to turn in neighbors and others, you know, there are a great deal of questions about how you really analyze pattern of life. Um, but I think the first step really starts in transparency and opening up these processes. Like, I didn't get videos. I asked for videos repeatedly. But with one exception, I got partial video of the Kabul strike and the intelligence that led up to it, as did another journalist that I, that I worked with, Charlie Savage. Um, but if you really want to figure out what's going wrong and why, we need to fully look at the system that we have. Um, the New York Times' visual investigations team also looked at a number of the files I obtained and the non-credibles and, you know, to really show like how often things were summarily dismissed, you know, without further investigation, simply by confusing like the name of a particular village or a particular place or whatever it might be. Like this, this occurred frequently and, um, you know, a real step towards understanding it would be opening up that back end, because even I have only a partial back end. You know, they were littered with redactions. Um, 
you know, the locations weren't disclosed. I had to go through a very specific specific route to try to figure out where these airstrikes took place, like matching air wars locations to them. And, you know, oftentimes they were incorrect. And so I think whatever the answer is, it starts with a great deal of transparency, um, much more than we currently have. To the room, uh, Kanal Singh. Uh, th thanks a lot. Uh, this was this was such a great talk. Uh, I'm wondering about uh, uh, which levels are these uh, attacks cleared, and is there a variation depending on uh, are these targets high value targets, and therefore more care is given to the intelligence collection, and uh, maybe the attack is cleared at a higher level, and if the target is not a high value target. Uh, Maybe the intelligence is not so good, and civilian casualties are more common in those. So, you know, a high value target, as identified by the coalition, can be somebody who's actually we might not consider very high level. So, like actually, in a lot of the documents, you see them identify somebody as a high value individual, an HVI. And um, in some cases, it was pretty clear who they were, but in many, it's just they would find one high value person, find another. But if you're talking about, for example, the Baghdadi raid, right? Um, yes, absolutely. That's an, that actually, you know, that's a very high value target that went through an incredible vetting process. But I had thought what you're saying right now, that like high value individuals go through a really rigorous process. They must go through the deliberate targeting process. Oftentimes they went through the dynamic targeting process, the one that took place quickly because they were in vehicles and you know, they might be tracked and there would be a moment of opportunity. So there was urgency involved. And the dynamic targeting process is far more rig far less rigorous than the, the deliberate targeting process. And I remember being a little surprised by that because I thought it would have been counterintuitive. Um, I think that, you know, the proportionality decisions are also a little bit more distinct as well. So, for example, if a high value individual happens to be at a particular location and there are civilians nearby, they might consider that more proportionally would than if they were not high value. Right. So I, I think that our you know, depending on, you know, what you're looking at and who you're looking at, like, I think that your notions of high value individuals necessarily having a more rigorous process don't actually hold up, or at least they don't in the documents that I obtained. Thanks. Zachary Burdett. Thanks so much for the, the talk. I've been following your reporting on this for a long time, and it's incredibly useful. So I, I want to follow up on Suzanne's question um, about implications for intelligence. Uh, and kind of push back on your answer to, to tease some things out, um, not because I necessarily disagree, but to see where we can get. So I think one thing I've been curious about is it seems like you've delved a lot into the cases where things went wrong. Um, but in terms of implications, I'm curious if you can speak to cases where there, there weren't errors. Uh, so for example, you note that uh, confirmation bias is one of the big things that you consistently see. But what is it, um, I mean, first of all, they, they, I my understanding of talking with, with friends and colleagues involved in, in both civilian and military sides of this is that they, they do heavily filter things like confirmation bias and, and techniques to avoid that into the training, right? And so why, why is it that these scenarios where things have gone wrong, in your mind, lend themselves to confirmation bias being an issue, whereas in other cases it's not? And how do we adjust the process to try and deal with that? And, and I think relatedly, I, I think it raises a larger question of how much of, of these cases are um, really intelligence failures that are contingent on if the training had been a little bit better, this would have you know turned out well, versus how much have we just kind of sold this narrative uh, that we can have this really precise warfare uh, and, and get away with these kinds of operations and that there's not just this base rate, that if you commit to these kind of operations, that it's not really an intelligence problem. It's once you commit to airstrikes in urban environments, you're always going to have high civilian casualty rates. So we've tried to sell this narrative domestically that we can change that, you know, and that we're different from the past. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious how you get it to the right, you know, how much of this is really intelligence and how much is more structural? So there's a lot to unpack there. So I want to start with the, the first part, and that was, you introduced a lot of great questions. Um, the first about, you know, you're looking at the subset of failures. Um, I just want to state that I didn't start from that place, right? So I started from a place of how many airstrikes are resulting in a civilian death and how many aren't. So I want to go back to that one in five number, right? That means four out of the five didn't result in civilian deaths, but that's like a very different rate from what they were publicly claiming. And so, you know, I began this by looking at 
also those that did result in a civilian death. So I determined what was the actual target of this airstrike. Um, was it a legitimate ISIS target and there was no civilian death? Like, you know, that was where I started from with this. And I don't want it to be like, I don't want there to be a misinterpretation of, you know, you're only looking at these flawed cases. You know, I began from a very base level. And frankly, that's something that the military doesn't do, right? They no longer do this ground investigation. It is not a thing. And only one instance did they go on the ground to the site of where one of these civilian casualty instances took place. And only in one another one did they actually interview survivors um, in these documents I obtained. And so, like, I just want to be very clear that we're talking about a level of information that your most sophisticated friends, partners, people who do this work, frankly, don't know. And I'll just, just to reemphasize that point, like, I was very much helped by people military officials who work on this air campaign. They help me understand these documents. They help me understand what they mean. I, I think that there is a great deal of retaliation that happens to people who, you know, uh, talk to journalists about this issue to help them understand it in this way. So I don't name them in my story, but they've been extraordinarily helpful. And these are people who also like believe, you know, in the power of this and specifically people who you know, would defend a lot of coalition actions, but wanted to talk to me because frankly, no, no one else is doing this on the ground, right? And they wanted to know, you know, what was being seen and heard. So I would just urge you to keep that in mind, you know, when you have these conversations with others about how are these taking place and what's going wrong here, I would emphasize that. Second, I would tell you that there were shifts in how these were conducted at various points in time that in 2014 and 2015, there was a lot more hesitancy around a lot of these airstrikes. There was a more onerous process to go through. Things had to be approved at a higher level and still civilian casualties were happening pretty systematically. Now, what you'll see in the documents as you, as you continue to look at them is like a very clear determination. I mentioned earlier that the number one, let's put confirmation bias aside for a second, but the number one factor that occurred in these incidents was that they had concluded there was no civilian presence in that area. Now that was happening pretty systematically, right? But again, if you're collecting very little intelligence in the first place, as was often happening, sometimes it was seconds of a collateral scan. Sometimes it was only minutes before an airstrike took place. Um, you're going to conclude that there was no civilian presence and your intelligence will be wrong. Now, this means that there is a systematic way in which like the system is flawed in a way such that intelligence is inadequately conducted right and by nature of that you are going to have instances of intelligence failures right throughout that because the system is set up in such a manner similarly when it comes to confirmation bias you know you probably know like i described when there were warning shots right when they tried to take precautions to prevent the deaths of civilians when they saw somebody enter the target frame and they aborted you know an airstrike or something that they had already sort of fired off you know there were different ways or means in which like people are taking great care i think there are people who work on this like again these people are talking to me like if there are people who work on this who are these are not like people who are out there trying to kill civilians but the process exists it functions in a matter that the steps they go through don't lend themselves to collect great intelligence, nor to, for example, if you're looking at intel all day and it's going through this mechanism and this screening system, and yet you're not really seeing much else, right? You're not interviewing survivors. You're not going on the ground. You're not taking the time to deconstruct what went wrong. You might conclude based largely the admissions that they did make or based on whether or not they saw people in footage, civilians in footage, and that could be a woman's body, it could be a child's body, it could be whatever. But in most of these cases, they did not have the correct number, you know, and in many cases that were rejected as non-credible, they only became credible after years of my pushing back. You know, they'd concluded that these people were ISIS. They never saw them in the first place. And so I would tell you that there is a serious gap in what we know, and there's a real lack of an effort to address that, right? Like, how can you be serious about the system of accountability if you're not going on the ground? for not talking to people? How can you truly understand? So even those who are saying like, I took these precautions, I did this thing, they very may well have, I believe they did. But there also isn't a systematic effort to understand what is actually happening and learn lessons from that. Thanks. Um, Kenoy. Uh, 
Thank you for, for a great talk on accounting and accountability. It's not a news story. In fact, we can go through plenty of examples of wars where both issues that you're describing, the numbers are wrong and accountability is limited, take place. In fact, it's typical. My question really is, can you give us examples, not of additional bad stories, we have plenty of them, but of military powers that have actually done accounting and accountability well? Thank you. That's a great question. And you're absolutely right that oftentimes this is, I mean, this has been the case throughout warfare and certainly warfare in urban environments. I think the difference now um, is that usually it takes many years for that accounting to take place, you know, and it, this one was happening in real time, which is quite distinct, right? To really get those numbers in real time. I would say that the one distinction was probably in Kosovo. There was like a ground sample of human rights researchers who really went hard at the same time shortly after that took place to bring that clarity out quickly. But for Vietnam, there are studies that are still being released. There was one that came out like a few years ago that I was just shocked to read examining air power. Um, and so it's a question of, you know, timeliness and making informed decisions based on an understanding of that war taking place. Um, but your question, can you remind me your the second part of your question, if you don't mind? The second part of the question was the hard part. Part, and it really is, can you give us examples of military powers that have done the accounting or the accountability well, or if not well, at least not as badly? Yes, I. Um, so I want to be careful that I'm just a reporter. I can't tell you my prescriptive models, but I can sort of weigh in on a very key comparison that we can make. And one comparison is with the Netherlands. And I just, you know, I came back from the Netherlands a few weeks ago because um, the Netherlands actually conducted the airstrike that I showed you the video of. They were the ones who dropped the bombs and it was the Americans who did the intelligence. Right. They also conducted an airstrike that resulted in mass civilian casualties in a part of Iraq called Hawija. And both of those airstrikes became the source of incredible public debate in the Netherlands when it came out. And in part, that was because a defense minister had previously said that there were no known, there was no known Dutch involvement in any confirmed credible civilian casualty incidents. And she told that to Dutch parliament, I think in 2015. And, you know, in 2016, it became apparent that there were two incidents that the Dutch government had kept from the public in which they'd been involved in civilian casualty incidents. In both cases, the intelligence was conducted by the U.S. and it's, you know, the, the coalition apparatus that it had, but the bomb was actually dropped by the Dutch Air Force. And, you know, it the a second defense minister was almost recalled from her position. It was like a, I think a no confidence vote in parliament there. And it became the subject of intense scrutiny. I was in the Netherlands recently because, you know, these Dutch, uh, this Dutch NGO was putting out a report about that airstrike in Hawija, which has been the source of incredible public debate there. And these two cases, these are only two cases they are known to have been involved in, has resulted in a major payment offer to one of the victims, money that went to the Iraqi government hasn't really reached the local population, if I'm understanding correctly, in Hawija. But it has been the subject of such scrutiny and accountability. Um, the coalition has released, you know, in the files, I think I got like, I have like 70 plus pages of the investigation to the incident in Hawija, um, which the Dutch were in. These are two, <laughs> the two incidents that I think are some of the most detailed were ones that involved another coalition country. Now. On the other hand, there are other countries that have released nothing, and, you know, France, the UK, that have made these kind of intense claims um, about having a very different approach and not having some of these civilian casualties. But I would, I would really draw you to the Dutch, and you know, I've been trying to understand. I've been asking, I was asking a lot of people in the Netherlands, like, why do you think that this resonated so widely? And one common interpretation was that, you know, there was it became politicized. Um, you know, that Dutch defense minister was associated with a particular administration and it became something that, you know, she was accused, you know, they were accused of covering it up and it resulted in this massive parliamentary inquiry. Um, some told me that like, look, we're a smaller country and, you know, we don't fight as many of these wars and it would be like, 
it would be like people feel more involvement and ownership of what their government is doing. And I don't know if this is true, you know, but I have been grappling with it. I think that, you know, it, the history and culture of service member, you know, connections to service members is part of, you know, why there might be more empathy reserved for, I mean, I think this is the case the world over. Citizens of a country are more likely to identify with the loss of their own than they are for, um, you know, civilians in some of the places that where we're fighting wars for a greater good. Um, so I don't know exactly why that is. I just know that there's a really key distinction here that's ripe for analysis. Thank you. We're going to go back to the Zoom. The Zoom. And I forgot to tell you earlier, we're going to have to end today at 1.15 because Asma has to teach at 1.30. Uh, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to pair questions now. Um, so Sarah and Aiden, uh, please ask your questions. And Asma, we'll come back to you. You can uh, pick and choose or try to answer both. And then I'll go to the next pair of questions that I think we'll, we'll wrap up. So uh, Sarah, then Aiden. Thank you so much for being here. This was um, really important work and extremely devastating. Um, I've been following your work for a while. I actually research um, the uh, Operation Inherent Resolve on, on the Syria side. A lot of my work is looking at um, the partnerships that the U.S. had with various groups on the ground. And so your work has been really important for what I do. Um, I wondered if actually I could ask about this, and you referred to this earlier, um, that there might be some differences that you saw between the air war and casualty rates in Syria as um, as opposed to Iraq. And I was just wondering if you could reflect a little bit about the differences, any differences you saw, or if there were um, more similarities than differences. So I actually, um, it was more Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria that I saw the differences between. Um, but I will say, though, that um, there were differences in accountability. So because of the Syrian civil war, there were all of these civil society groups documenting things that were occurring in real time. And so there was a lot more online resources to draw from when, for example, you're looking at, you know, a claim about an airstrike. And so you would see far more, um, you know, the Syrian violation, you know, the VDC, like all of these different groups um, in Syria were often putting out with incredible precision and clarity numbers and calculating what was happening because of, you know, this protracted effort and a really strong civil society base. Um, whereas in Iraq, I didn't see that as much. Um, you know, there would be Facebook groups and particular things that kind of sprung out over time, but that infrastructure didn't already exist when this air war began taking place. So you'll see a lot more visual evidence and a lot more online evidence coming out of Syria than you will Iraq. In terms of casualties, like you, I'm, this is a good question because, um, you know, you're talking about involvement with groups on the ground, and that also plays a role in terms of, you know, uh, not just the intelligence for airstrikes, but, you know, who's providing it and what might their involvement be. And I do know you can see some differences in terms of areas where the Americans were working with Kurdish forces or whomever, or particular um, groups where there was better intelligence. And one difference I saw is because they had these kinds of close relationships. I forget the name of the village now. It was in, it was in Derizor. No, I can't remember where it was, but um, I think it, I'll have to double check. But um, it was a place where the Americans had allied themselves with a local tribal group. And they bombed it several times. Um, and there was a mass casualty incident. And you know, they had seen the effects of this, and it's one of the only places where they made a payment offer, right? And in large part, I think it's because they had close relationships. Um, you know, it was like published, I think it was like published, it was broken in Kurdish media, if I remember correctly, the, the this payment being made. And I like looked into it and confirmed it as credible. And, you know, that was one thing that surprised me as well. You won't see those kinds of payments being made. And part of that is because of those like interwoven relationships that occur. Um, you know, that was one part of it, but in terms of more comparisons, I think it would also just depend on which territory in Syria you're talking about. So I looked a lot at Thabka where, um, you know, Thabka and Raqqa, but like in Thabka, I saw a trend of in the lead up to that fight to take Thabka, you saw like a 
ton of airstrikes that had been previously prepared suddenly greenlit, greenlit and that intelligence was now outdated. Um, I went to this dam in Thubka that I wrote a subsequent story about. Um, so I can tell you about specific places, but it's hard for me to make broad comparisons, unfortunately. But that was a great question. Hi, uh, thanks very much for this talk. I wanted to ask you a question that I think gets back to some of your work before the uh, casualty files, like uh, your work on counting civilian deaths. Um, when you talked about the ways that uh, death data in wars is, is bad or messed up, that really caught my attention because a lot of political scientists use those data to try and learn about wars. Uh, and I think a lot of us recognize that they're flawed. So from your experience and what you know about the countries you've worked in, what do you think are the major ways that you've seen that data be biased? And what would it take to make it better? That is a great question. Now, with Afghanistan and those United Nations numbers, I don't think it was an effort to be biased. It was just a process that inherently, I think, I can't remember, but there's a, a, a methodology that they use to calculate those that in its rigor can unfortunately um, exclude a large number of deaths. And by that, I mean, you know, they required, I think, two, three sources or two sources to acknowledge a casualty, to, you know, um, confirm it. Now, these are official sources. and. When you're looking for that and somebody doesn't have death records and they are so isolated from that government that news of this death is unlikely to reach them. And the only real evidence of it being documented is a tombstone in an area you will never have access to. That information isn't going to float back to them. I think that the IRC, there are certain groups that have better access in some areas and do get information um, that can sometimes work its way to other organizations. And that is one that I think had great presence in Afghanistan, but that is not what they function to do, right? So, you know, that that is not their, I think by staying out of that phrase, how they're able to do the work that they do. Um, and so there may be some groups that have better data um, or are being helpful and sort of passing it on. But even then, in most of these places that I went to, and I wouldn't just look at my work because again, like this was Kandahar, um, but I would look at Anand Gopal's work in Helmand province. Um, he wrote a magazine story called The Other Afghan Women that came out in September that I would encourage you to read, which found much higher death rates than I did in Helmand in an area called Sangin. Um, but I think that in part it comes down to, you know, establishing information networks. So official sor sources that are going to come to the UN, the UN, which its compound is in like Afghan government controlled territory and you know, these kinds of places, like how much is going to reach them? And so it comes down to where are there more, where is there more freedom of movement of information? And in Afghanistan, I think a major hindrance was that, um, I mean, there was no, it's not even just, there wasn't the internet in most of these areas, in these real battlefield areas. There was also not even like mobile lines. Mobile lines were constantly cut. And, you know, somebody would have to like sneak into territory, get out, with a video in order to upload it. Um, and, you know, I had sources who were sending it, just wake up in 2019 to these really grotesque videos and in my WhatsApp in the morning. And, uh, you know, they would never appear on the internet, not once, because that's just not what would happen there. And so I think it's in large part, it's about freedom of information. And it raises questions about access to mobile technology and to internet technology and you'll see that this has become you know a major crisis of war is attacking you know that kind of information and freedom of um flow of information make sure you can get to your class um some apologies to those i didn't get you on the list um but thank you so much uh, for a really stimulating talk. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here today. If anyone has any additional questions, you can reach out to me from my website, and hopefully we'll be in touch. Thanks again. All right, great. Thank you.